Uh, hi, I'm Brian Roach. I'm a researcher at the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University. And I'm here today with Dr. Francis Stewart, who we're happy to honor with our 2013 Leontiev Prize for Advancing Economic Thought. Uh, welcome, Dr. Stewart. Dr. Stewart. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you. Uh, you are a development economist at Oxford University. And most of your work concerns alleviating poverty in developing countries. Before we can alleviate poverty, we have to first define what we mean by poverty. And traditionally, poverty has been defined according to income levels, like the World Bank has set various poverty thresholds, uh, such as $2 per day. Uh, but you've noted in your research that poverty is multidimensional, and there are other ways to measure poverty. So how would you advocate that we measure poverty? Well, poverty is really quite an ill-defined concept. It means, in a way, deprivation. But deprivation of what? And if you think about the World Bank money income line, it's just deprivation of money income. But there are so many other aspects of life which that doesn't encompass. Uh, for example, you can be, have money income but no education. You could have money income and there's no health service nearby, and so on and so forth. So you need a much broader base definition now, I personally don't think that there's a unique, correct definition. I think you can take different approaches, uh, depending on what questions you're trying to ask and, and how, how you think, uh, what sort of people you want to target, what the policy context is. But I would say that we had tried four different types of definition. Um, part of our research was to see, if you do have different definitions, do you reach different people? Do you do I identify different people as being poor? Because obviously that's very important because you use one definition and you may be missing out a whole lot of other people. So the four definitions we used was, on the one hand, we did take the monetary poverty line. We did it in particular countries and we didn't take the World Bank line, which is a rather crude international line. We took the country's own definition of poverty, their own monetary poverty line, because that's the one they were using in policy. So that was the first. Second, we turned to Amartya Sen's approach to development of capabilities and tried to define poverty in terms of deprivation in capabilities. And of course there are massive capabilities, or capabilities of things you are able to be or do, so you can have a very large range, but we tried to choose some very important ones for poor people. So we had a measure of education, we had a measure of nutrition, um, we had a measure of health, and we tried to define a poverty line for each of those measures. And I should say, of course, where you define the poverty line, whether it's monetary or capability, is a bit arbitrary, but we chose a poverty line. So if you haven't got any education, if you're illiterate, you're clearly educationally poor. But you could put the poverty line higher and say if you only have primary education or you've got incomplete primary education. Okay. And nutrition, we said if you are, uh, if it's a definition for children, if you fall below um, one standard deviation from what is normal, uh, then you're poor nutritionally. So we have these various definitions. So that was the second type of definition of poverty. And that, of course, uh, was multidimensional. I mean, we had several dimensions. Okay. We didn't necessarily add them up. Thirdly, we thought, well, how do people see it themselves? How do poor people perceive poverty? Let's ask poor people. Do, who do they think are poor, uh, and then see if that corresponds to some of the other measures. Okay. And then fourthly, we used a concept that's very popular in Europe called social exclusion. And that is, in some ways, you are excluded from society. And it's an interesting concept because all the other ones just say poverty's out there, but it doesn't say why or who's doing it to you, whereas social exclusion, you're actually being excluded. So there's an implication that someone's excluding you. Okay. And the social exclusion, almost by definition, is a relative concept. It's relative to society that you're socially excluded, whereas the others can be quite absolute. So, all right, we took these four and we tried them in a couple of countries, Peru and some places in India, and we compared what, what were the results. And we found radically different people were defined as poor under the four. Uh, and that really is important. Just one example, we found that Many people in India who are not monetarily poor are nutritionally poor. Many, about 50% of the nutritionally poor are not monetarily poor. 
So if you're just using monetary property, you're just going to miss out that other 50%. So it's really important what definition you have. And it pulls a particular policy. Uh, if you're looking at monetary property, of course, what you think about is how can we get money to people? If you think about the market and that sort of approach. If you're thinking about capability property, you think much more about the state. How can the state provide health and education? How well correlated were people's perceptions of poverty with the various other measures? That's interesting. Not very well. Yeah. Almost as badly. <laughs> and also, what was interesting, many of them didn't think they were poor themselves. Many of them said, yeah, in, in that village over there, there's poor people, but we're not poor. So that was interesting. Okay. okay. So I guess you are also critical of the Human Development Index as a measure of poverty. Well, the Human Development Index isn't a measure of poverty. It's meant to be a measure of development, which is much broader than poverty. Um, and I'm critical and I'm not critical of the Human Development Index. I was present when it uh, was first developed and we had a lot of debate and I can't say that I was particularly in favour of it. In fact, there was only one person who was really in favour of it and that was Mahbub ul Haq, who was the founder of the Human Development okay. Approach. But um, I think it's been tremendously useful. I think it's really redirected attention away from GNP and towards human development. And I think without that index, we wouldn't have got that sort of mileage at all. So no, I don't think it's a very sophisticated measure, but I do think it's had a you know, very important role to play. Uh, let's talk about the progress we've made in alleviating poverty and promoting human development. Uh, it's 2013, and we're two years away from the 2015 target date for the Millennium Development Goals. And we've had kind of a mixed success. Um, can you talk a little bit about where we've achieved success and where we're falling short of the Millennium Development Goals? Yeah, I think the success has been mixed in lots of ways. It's been mixed in terms of regions. Um, we find, for example, that East Asia has always has done very well, Latin America has done well, Africa has done less well. And then even within regions we find mixtures, like if you take Asia, um, clearly if you took a uh, uh, place like Malaysia has done excellently, but then India's not done so well, and Afghanistan, of course, is a disaster. So what we find is a mixture um, by, by country. We even find a mixture within countries, although the MDGs are national, so they don't pick that up. But if you take Nigeria, they've done pretty well on the poverty index, but the North has done very badly. It actually got worse off, and they were the worse off to start with, so there's a mixed story. There's also a mixed story in terms of the individual indicators. There are eight objectives right. and many, many more indicators in the MDGs. And if you look at them overall, I think we're broadly on target for the poverty reduction at a global level. And a lot of that's due to China right. and big success. Uh, but we're really falling behind on maternal mortality. So there has been a mixture in terms of success and failure. Right. Have we learned anything about policies that are effective? Um, I think we've learnt something about policies that are effective. Um, maybe that we knew that already, though. Right. You know, that if you have very good growth and not too bad distribution, you do well. If the state is very strong and is good at providing services and cash transfers and so on, you do, do well. So I think we've learned quite a lot about that. I think we've also learnt about some deficiencies in the original MDGs, things they didn't do. I, one thing they didn't do was say anything about the economy. Okay. They were goals, but they didn't say what was the underlying economy. So what's been happening is that you've had attention on the goals, a lot of donor expenditure has gone into social expenditure, but you've had a neglect in some ways of the economy in many countries, uh, you know, not so much spent on infrastructure. Um, and you've had the same old economy, which really caused the troubles in the first place in the sense of a very liberalised market economy and a very high rise in inequality in many countries. So I think in the future we need to worry more about that. And in particular, we need to worry more about inequality. And also, the girls initially had nothing to say about employment. As time went on, an employment girl was introduced. But it, they really haven't delivered on employment, and we know that there's a massive employment problem around the world, a deficiency of employment. So that's another way in which the girls really haven't themselves been good enough. In thinking about the future, uh, there's been some discussion in the international community about where we go after the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, do you advocate, say, looking ahead 
to the next 15 year period to, to 2030, should we develop a new set of development goals or should we just scrap that strategy and take a different approach to quantifying success and development? Well, I don't think we should scrap it because in, in a way it was a way of the world coming together and saying these human values are really important and we all agree and we all have a commitment. And I think if we now said, oh no, it's sort of like a failure and a moving away from that. So I think that would be a mistake. Okay. But I think we should have a different approach to the goals in the future. Uh, the goals were agreed in a very top-down sort of way in New York. And then countries signed up to them. And not the same goals aren't always appropriate for every country. Right. And as I said, they had some deficiencies anyway. Uh, so I feel that what we should do this time round is have an agreement on principles rather than goals. On principles where we want to go. Um, for example, obviously, poverty reduction, but not necessarily saying how much. But I think we also need to worry about human security. It's not just a question of people getting less poor, but also being subject to less risks, being subject to less violence. All sorts of things they really care about. People, when asked, put security in terms actually of security against physical assault right at the top. So there are a lot of things like that which we could encompass in the security uh, principle, including sec security against health hazards, security against environmental hazards and so on. So that's another principle. A third principle I would have is uh, participation, that the goals should be decided in a participatory way and that development should be in a participatory way. So, so my feeling is that um, what we should do is come together on a discussion of principles, and I, of course, have forgotten to say the most, well, not the most important, but a very critical principle, which is sustainability. Right. So we come together on agreement on principles, and we then ask particular countries, or every country, to decide on the goals that, which are suitable for them in the light of these principles. Okay. And then they can come back to the centre, so to speak, and say, look, these are our goals and they can be monitored and so on. But I would like to see them in a much more decentralised way. And I would like to see, which is not very likely, but I'd like to see the North doing it as well as the South. I'd like to see the US having its goals. Okay, having its goals. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so during the process of the initial Millennium Development Goals, the developing countries had minimal input into setting those goals? Was it a total top-down approach? It was very much a top-down um, yeah, it was initiated. Actually, the goals initially were developed in the OECD and were sort of handed over to the UN and they were picked up and so on. So, yeah, very much a top-down process. And it's been very much a donor agenda. Developing countries have come along with it and have taken them seriously, but it, it was very much the donors who were driving the whole thing. Okay. Well, following up on that, what have we learned about the effectiveness of international development aid in promoting poverty alleviation? Well, probably a huge amount, but I'm a bit of a sceptical about aid, I have to okay. say. I think fundamentally countries should do it themselves and it's much better if they can do it through trade and, if, and their own development and their own production. And that aid can play a very useful supplementary role, but not shouldn't dominate. I mean, in some countries, aid accounts for almost the entire budget and I think that's a very unhealthy relationship. Um, so I would try to move away from that. Um, how to do effective aid, that's, yeah, I mean, that's tricky because in a way you're asking for the impossible because the best way of doing effective aid would be to find some very efficient, effective people and effective projects and support them okay. and your aid would be very effective. But then it's not what you want, you want to help the ones who are not effective, who are not efficient. So almost you want to seek for, you know, ineffective aid because that's where you, it's really needed rather than at the... Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm sure I can find you lots of efficient projects you could support. Right. You know, they wouldn't work necessarily help all that much. Okay. What, what do you think of the UN target of 0.7% uh, of gross national income in international aid? It's, I'm sort of schizophrenic about it because, you know, as a northerner, I feel, and as a, you know, obviously my income is right at the top of the world's distribution. <laughs> Uh, not as high as the bankers, but, you know, pretty high in relation to all those poor people. So I feel that there's a sort of obligation for us as rich nations to do something for developing countries. But at the same time, as I said, I'm not so enthusiastic about what aid can deliver and how useful it will be. <coughs> I think that in the future, I think there are probably two areas in particular that aid should play a big role. One is the humanitarian 
aid, which of course it already does, but wherever there's a catastrophe, it's tremendously useful if money and resort and technicians and people are ready to go and can really support things. So that's one big area. And the other huge area is the uh, climate change. Okay. And aid can play a huge role in trying to persuade people which it, it, to um, do carbon saving um, technology and so on, and can play a huge role in compensating countries and helping them adapt to climate change. So I, would, I think it's quite likely that the old-fashioned aid will actually go down and much, much more of this aid should be in that sort of area. Okay. Are you hopeful that an international climate change treaty can be devised that is acceptable to both rich and poor countries? Well, I'm not very hopeful, no. I'm hoping that nations are going to begin to take this seriously enough to simply take national action. And I think they're beginning to, but not fast enough. I agree with you on that. Uh, let's talk about the relationship between economic growth and human development. And most economists have traditionally advocated that economic growth leads to human development. But your research has looked at it in the opposite direction, right? That sometimes human development is a precursor for economic growth. And you've shown that while there are some countries that have had successful economic growth uh, and human development, there are essentially no countries where a country has achieved economic growth without human development at the same time, speaking more broadly in terms of education and health outcomes and so on. Uh, what, what's the lesson of your research on that topic? I think it's tremendously important because, as you quite rightly said, the traditional idea is have your economic growth and then you'll be able to afford to do your human development, so wait. But uh, what our research suggests is that this is actually not a viable strategy because people are your most important resource. And if you don't have educated and healthy people, how are you going to have your economic growth? And if we think about, you know, very successful countries like, let's say, South Korea, first thing they did was have wonderful education for everybody, and then they could have the economic growth. So I think that the traditional attitude that you can't afford to do human development at the beginning is just really stupid because it is, is self-defeating. It's not going to happen. Um, so very important lesson. You must... Uh, invest in people. Now, it doesn't mean you also neglect the economy, you need to do both at once. But if you're going to make a choice, investing in people is more important uh, than the economy. Okay. Have international agencies like the World Bank and IMF accepted this approach? Um, they, well, certainly the World Bank pays due respect to what they call human resources and human, human capital and investment in, in people. But when it comes to it, when it comes to the crunch, particularly the IMF, they, um, they say cut, cut your expenditure. In fact, recently I've done some research, uh, well, I've, in, the, in the 1980s I did some work with UNICEF about the impact of adjustment policies on poor people, and we found that those who got IMF programs um, really cut their ex social expenditures, so it was very much uh, the opposite of what I've been saying. And in fact, that's what really inspired some of this work that we did. But then recently, I've been looking at the crisis of the 2000s and comparing it with the um, 1980s and see, you know, what have we learned? And the interesting thing is countries have learned a lot and they didn't cut back on social expenditure. But they also learned that it's better not to get in the hands of the IMF. So a lot of them had saved a lot of resources and reserves and so on. Many fewer of them had IMF programs this time around, but the ones that did, once again, had less good social expenditure. So the IMF may, hasn't learned all that much, but the, uh, the countries have. So is it clear in the wake of the financial crisis that those countries that were most closely tied to IMF conditions suffered the most? I haven't done the research to say suffered the most all round, but what we did find was that those were the ones that suffered the most in terms of cutting social expenditure, yes. Okay. So the lesson for developing countries is not one of austerity, but one of actually increased expenditures. Well, it, the first lesson is protect your social expenditures. Okay. But I think also, I mean general thinking, I don't think that austerity is the right way forward. Um, and in fact, what you found this time round was a lot of countries did what they call a stimulus, which nobody did in the 1980s. And uh, some of them huge, you know, so like 5% of their national income, a really big stimulus. In other words, they spent a lot 
And it's interesting comparing developed and developing countries because initially uh, developed countries also did stimulus and they certainly had stimulus in the US. But the developed countries' stimulus was much more about tax cuts and the developing countries' stimulus was much more about expenditure. A lot of them did infrastructure expenditure, expenditure on protecting the poor, social expenditure. And as a result, I think they didn't suffer anything like as much as in the previous crisis. Okay. And does it seem to be those countries that have spent the most are in the best situation looking forward? Well, there is a sort of there's a sort of uh, kickback or whatever. I mean, the sense that if they've spent a lot, they now got a deficit. They're now beginning to have a debt, and so they're having to cut back a bit. But I think yes, I think they did do better than the ones who didn't spend a lot. And uh, the commodity prices have been good. A lot has to be a lot of credit in a ways due to China's massive demand, which has kept up commodity prices. So this time around, you found that Africa really suffered very little. And I did a, a small study of sort of six countries, which was selected rather arbitrarily, um, so not very, not very representative sample, but I just wanted to get inside what each country was doing. And I found that Uganda was, did best out of the six who were really hardly affected at all, and their poverty continued to go down, and you know, their, their development went on because they had good commodity prices. Aid didn't really turn down, um, and so they were able to continue. And countries which were very badly affected, uh, were, well, the worst affected was Eastern Europe, who had IMF programs and yeah. you know, asked to cut. Even those but, that had resources? Um, well, as a group. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I didn't differentiate between them, but as a group they were the worst affected. And in the short run, although they recovered very nicely, Latin America was very badly affected, Mexico particularly because it's so tied to the US. Remittances went down, exports went down, foreign direct investment went down, everything was negative. And they had a quite sharp rise in poverty for a, a short period. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Stu. That was very informative.